Welcome to the Borderland Beat Podcast, streaming live from the Southwest. The Borderland Beat Project is a collaboration from a group of people of different backgrounds, located in the United States and Mexico. These people gather information related to the Mexican drug cartels and present it in English through the internet, publications, and presentations. This show will give a perspective of the complicated issues of both neighboring countries, Mexico and the United States. We will cover the cartel activities and how one side can impact the other. It is important for both sides of the border to understand how mayhem and ruthless violence from organized crime touches the people on the border and the miseries it brings to everyday social conditions we sometimes call civilization. Because cartel crime in Mexico is extremely violent, this show depicts large amounts of very graphic material. The need to present graphic source material is vital in showing a true representation of the extent of violence generated by the Mexican drug cartels upon the people of Mexico and the United States. The Mexican drug war is an ongoing armed conflict taking place among rival drug cartels that fight each other for regional control of the plazas and Mexican government forces which seeks to combat drug trafficking. Although Mexican drug cartels or drug trafficking organizations also known as DTO have existed for a few decades, they have become more powerful since the demise of Colombia's Cali and Medellin cartels in the 1990s. The information that we will be presenting is fast-paced, with a lot of DTO information thrown at you all at once. It's filled with Sicario activities and the Mexican government's attempt to intervene. But it also contains a lot of direct behind-the-scenes information from the moderator Bugs. This particular information is the involvement of Bugs from his early stages when he started to formalize his plan to bring to life the Borderland B project. Let's follow Bugs as he sets the stage and takes you on a wild ride into the dark shadows of the violence and chaos of the Mexican drug cartels. A narrative as told in the deep dark pages of the Borderland Beat Block. Welcome to the podcast. We are live. Welcome to the show, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. We uh, are doing a brand new podcast, and uh, with us today is my co-host, or host, depending on how you look at it. We're both hosting this show, but Alex is next to me. Uh, welcome to the show, buddy. Yeah, happy to be here. This is this is your show. So we are going to talk cartel, and uh, it's a sensitive subject. Uh, viewer discretion advised, as you can tell from the uh, uh, introduction, the uh, fabulously produced introduction, by the way. Uh, th- <laughs> thanks for that, Alex. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know whose voice that was. It was pretty creepy. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we are going to talk cartel stuff. Uh, we had a special guest lined up for today, but uh, she backed out at the last minute. Uh, you can talk to us a little bit about that, why yeah, that happened. We're going to try to get um, you know guests to kind of talk about the cartel uh one of the things that um was it was it, that is important you know i get a lot of people talking about maybe uh, the, the cartel presence in the u.s uh, specifically in albuquerque you know we're based out of albuquerque and um there's a huge uh like any other city in the southwest there's a huge uh, mexican national influence presence here and um you know, in cartels, you find them pretty much everywhere. And they've been here for quite a, quite a long time. And the cartels uh, in Mexico are making a lot of money, billions of dollars from the U.S. Sell, uh, trafficking drugs. And, um, and th- so there's a connection. And one of the things that we wanted to do was bring someone. Uh, this, this person is from Culiacan, where the Sinaloa cartel originates from. And um, she has um, a lot of personal information. Uh, the, the thing with cartels, especially with um, people that are in the mix, you know, 
they may not be participating, but they know someone, or p perhaps they have family members. And you know, it's a very scary thing because cartels um, really don't take kindly to anybody that that is talking or talking about them on a personal basis. So, uh, so I can see why you know she's apprehensive about talking. Initially, she was going to, but. Um, but you know they, they decided not to at the last minute, and it's fine. It's okay. Uh, we they certainly don't want to put any anyone's life in danger, uh, even here in the U.S. Um, so you know, and I know because I I have dealt with a lot of uh, collaborators, a lot of people that that um, you know uh, are part of the Borderland Beat project, and most of them are in Mexico and. And a lot of them are, fo you know, boots on the ground. They do research. They talk to people. They really know what they're doing, and they're reporting on on the cartel activities. So you know, it's very dangerous. We've had, in fact, we, we've had uh, cartel uh, uh, borderland beat collaborators that have uh, have uh, disappeared. That we lost track, and uh, all these uh, collaborators that report on the borderland beat project are anonymous we don't even know who they are i don't and no one else does so when we lose track and they uh, suddenly disappear you know we just don't know how to give more information to know what happened to them so that's what so happened. let's uh the, uh the cat the cat is out of the bag a little bit already on how this this all started but the uh bugs bugs is your uh, name that you go by you started this blog back in 2008 and uh, you started it. Uh, it was a, it was a blog basically uh, uh, stemmed from from an incident uh, here that happened here at Albuquerque when you were a police officer uh, as a SRO. Is is that correct? Yeah, a, a little bit about me. Uh, I was born in Ciudad Juarez. Um, uh, came here to the to Albuquerque in the United States uh, at around ten years old. My father wor actually worked for the city of Albuquerque. Uh, prior to that, he was working uh, in El Paso for Tony Lama. We used to live in Juarez, so he's, he used to commute every day. Decided to move over here. Uh, I joined, uh, I graduated from high school, uh, joined the Marines for eight years. And then eventually I joined the Albuquerque Police Department. So I come with a law enforcement background. Um, and uh, in 2008, uh, actually in 2006, President Felipe Calderon uh, became president of Mexico, he's a PAN uh, candidate, a pan, that's his party. And the PAN is um, the more conservative uh, political party. Prior to him, it was Vicente Fox, who's also a PAN. And, and before, you know, PRI was, used to get elected all the time, you know. And they tend to be the more liberal party. Uh, so Vicente Fox uh, campaigned that he was gonna take on the cartels, and he did to a degree. Uh, and, you know, Mexico's, there's a lot of corruption at the highest level. But Felipe Calderon decided that he was gonna take the cartels. Uh, so he, when he came on, he revamped the whole federal police, had to rely on the military to do a lot of his um, interaction or dealing with the cartels. Uh, and uh, till he was able to get his federal police uh, going. Uh, the US was providing a lot of uh, aid and money the um, Merida Initiative was providing uh, millions of dollars that Felipe Calderon was able to use to buy equipment, to training, and everything else. Now when you see federal police uh, that, that hit, uh, they typically will uh, saturate hot areas where there's a lot of uh, cartel activity, and you'll see them in trucks, like uh, a team of four or five in trucks, uh, you know, dressed in tactical with hel uh, you know helmets and vests and uh, AR 15s rifles like a tactical unit would, and that's the whole federal police. That's basically a whole SWAT team of federal police that are uh, taking on the cartels. So uh, he started to take, take on the cartels, and that created a lot of vacuum when cartels were getting killed or arrested. Uh, he's one of the ones, actually, Felipe Calderon, they started extraditing a lot of these high uh, end capos into to the United States, allowing the extradition of them. And um, I used to travel a lot in, in Mexico. I have family, I have friends, um, and I would travel extensively into Mexico. And I started to see a change. 
And sometimes, you know, we live here in the United States, like in Albuquerque, and we really don't see the extent of violence that was happening. No, we're, we're very naive to what's going on down south. Believe me, that uh, the, the media doesn't report even one percent of what's going on down there and so we, yeah. we grew up a, a very naive to the whole situation we know we know that it's drug related uh we've all seen the the movies uh with uh with pablo and and uh and uh, uh all these famous drug dealers uh that uh that have gotten have become billionaires uh trafficking drugs so it's it's pretty obvious that uh that, that drugs uh stem uh, most of this violence, uh, and uh, people are commenting that uh, yeah, that's the, that's let's get to the point. You know, that's that first and foremost, that's what it is. It's it, it's drugs, and yes. the need of the United States is is fueling that. And uh, if you guys uh, just 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 to kind of give a break there, if you guys have questions or anything like that, we'll get to it. Uh, just just post it on there. Uh, we're also live on uh, YouTube. So if uh, if you're watching on any of those, just uh, send a comment. And we'll we'll try to get to it. But uh, drugs is definitely yeah. what uh, what this is all about. Right. So exactly, and that's what cartels. That's why they exist for trafficking drugs, spe specifically in the United States. The United States is a very lucrative uh, profession for them. You know, they make up millions of dollars, billions of dollars, in trafficking drugs. But what happened was uh, in 2008. Um, Juarez was probably one of the most dangerous cities in the world, right across the border. El Paso in 2008, I think they had like 11 homicides, very low number. <laughs> yeah, see, and Juarez right across the border. And I started to see uh, some of that uh, just in my everyday life, uh, in my law enforcement background. Uh, when I was, uh, you mentioned uh, SNSRO, a school resource officer, I was assigned to Jefferson Middle School in 2008, and I met this little girl, her name was Alicia. Uh, she was about 80 years old, and um, she lived with her mother. And, uh, they had a real beautiful house in, on Ridgecrest, which is a very affluent neighborhood. Nice part of town. Right. And she drove like a brand new Escalade. I was dressed really nice. But I never saw the father, so one day I asked her about her father, and she says, well, he, live, he lives in Juarez. So, and I go, well, and I'm like, well, where do you get all your money? She goes, well, he sends money to us. So, uh, anyways... Um, uh, I got to know her mom, very, you know, uh, spoke very little English. Uh, Lisa spoke, uh, you know, good English. Pretty good bilingual. Yeah, yeah. bilingual. So, um, so they would, she told me they would go visit her, her father during the summer, when, during the school break. So that summer she went uh, to Juarez and school started again and she didn't come back. So the principal asked me, they, they didn't withdraw her and he wanted to know what happened to her. So he asked me to do a home visit. So I went to the house, got knew where it was, and of course there was nobody there, a knock and everything else. I got a hold of her cousin, and ended up ended up talking to her aunt, uh, her mom, who was Alicia's aunt, and she told me that that uh, her uh, father, her mo mother, and her her three year old little brother were killed in Juarez. Yeah. So uh, so she gave me a phone number for Alicia's mom. She had moved, like, um, her aunt, her other aunt from San Antonio took her in. So she ended up moving to San Antonio with her aunt on her uh, mother's side. Uh, the aunt here was on the father's side. So, um, so I spoke with Alicia's aunt in San Antonio, and she told me that, yeah, she's over here. Um, you know, um, it did happen. And as I started looking into it more further as to what happened, I found uh, the incident on, on, uh, on the Internet. And basically what happened is uh, they were uh, in a car, in a uh, uh, gold... Um, uh, Escalade. Esca no, no, it was an Escalade. It was like um, Continental. Um, it was a car. And they got intercepted from... Uh, the f uh, they were in a traffic stop, and they got intercept intercepted by two trucks. And uh, they came out of the trucks, and they started uh, shooting at them with... Uh, assault rifles and they killed the mom in the, pa in the front uh, passenger seat they killed the little boy three-year-old boy in the back seat and the guy on the driver's side killed the father and uh, talking to uh, witnesses they said that uh, Sicario pointed his rifle at Alicia but did not shoot her for some reason maybe 
maybe he had a daughter and can feel good about it, but Alicia survived. And uh, that's, you know, that's one of the incidents, but there was other incidents that really drew me into the cartel, me, me, uh, not, not involved with the cartel, but really trying to find, find out what, what was happening. And the other thing, you know, I'm talking to other police officers where I worked and around the state, not, no one really knew what, what was happening uh, over there. They, you know, very little. I mean, I myself did not know a lot about the cartel, uh, but that you know that started me going and trying to find out more about the cartels in in Mexico. Well, so that little uh, Alisa story is fascinating. I mean, when you told me that uh, several years ago, it was. Uh, I mean, it's it's touching because it makes you want to reach out to her and uh, years later now and and just say you know we're we're thinking of you and and. Uh, reach out, find out how she's doing, you know, and, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's a horrible story, uh, what happened to her family, but uh, it's, it's the, the life that she was born into, I guess, and, and she had no say in it. Her, her father was uh, obviously pretty highly connected in some way for them to have wanted to take him out. From what I understand, yeah. there were a lot of drugs and money yeah. in the vehicle that, that, that they just left behind. Right, one of the things that I found out uh, was that, um, you know, they found out that he was actually a lieutenant for La Linea, which La Linea is the arm wing of the Juarez cartel. Back in 2008, Sinaloa and Chapo Guzman decided to take uh, the, the Juarez Plaza from the Juarez cartel. So he wanted the, um, that plaza because that's one of the main Thur entry ports, thoroughways, yeah. thoroughways for for trafficking. So uh, instead of paying, you know, uh, to cross, you know, he decided I'm taking it over. Actually, El Chapo during that time took over uh, Tijuana, and he was very ambitious about taking over the whole Mexico. And he was, of course, he was making millions of dollars, and that caused, you know, uh, uh, a lot of violence in in Juarez. And so I found out it was La Linea. I didn't really didn't know much about La Linea then in 2008. Later on, believe it or not, I actually, um, a, in contacts that I had, I, I knew a commander in the Juarez Police Department. And he actually had me uh, meet someone. And I actually went to Juarez to meet somebody uh, late at night Crazy to fucker. find out about <laughs> La Linea. And I was, you know, I was kind of worried because... Uh, you know, I started to we started to get a lot of videos from from cartel members where they were doing executions, and I'm not talking about just executions where they kill someone. They were t they were Graphic. beheading, yeah. you know, dismembered, uh, they were really extremely violent. And uh, I remember going to Juarez to meet with someone that was going to talk to me about La Linea and all those videos that I saw. We used to have, we used to have a guy that was part of those Los Losetas in Tamaulipas. It was always sending us uh, videos of executions. He would record them with his phone, and he would send them send them to us through uh, the Borland Beat uh, Gmail. Um, What's up with these guys that film it on the uh, on the cheap phone uh, in vertical mode too? I mean, they really <laughs> step up their production value. Yeah. With with that, but that's nah, it's, it's messing around. So so, but you know, it, it, I watched many of those videos, and um, so when I went out there, you know, I mean it. it they can be pretty intimidating when you're over there. Uh, you know, people get killed just for nothing sometimes. But um, yeah, so uh, I mean, that was my my. I mean, I, I wrote a I wrote a book. Uh, you know, my my involvement with um, with the Bottle and Beat uh, was from 2008 when I started. I started it on my own. What I would do, I'm I'm bilingual. I'm a certified. Um, you know, I do translations, I'm a certified translator. And, uh, you know, and back, back then I was going to school for translating, so I would use that to practice translating just news about cartels. And then I started a blog, and, and before I knew it, I had a lot of people joining, uh, you know, from different backgrounds, you know, reporters. They were afraid to report because, uh, you know, Mexico is one of the most dangerous countries for journalists that get killed all the time, you know. So uh, they wanted a platform where they could remain anonymous and they could free, uh, freely report on things. So they joined uh, our project and, um, you know, that's how it started. And and uh, all the way to 2013 where, you know, it's kind of started to, uh, you know, subside a little bit, but, you know, but it never stopped. And, uh, you know, there was some personal things that happened 
it um, they find you know I went for from 2008 through 2013 I went by the by bugs yeah I was uh, anonymous. Bugs money nobody knew who I was I mean I'm telling you I I used to tell I used to talk to officers that were friends of mine here in Albuquerque and I would tell them yeah I'm gonna go to Mexico and visit over there and they would tell me dude you're crazy don't go over there man you need to read Borderland Beat and find out all of the shit that goes on over there. And it's like, oh. we, we, found, we found this cool blog on, on the internet. Man. Yeah. The internet was still pretty new back then, too. It, it's not like it is now. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't as big, but, uh, yeah, people were still getting on. And, and, uh, yeah, and, and, and I can tell you, the Borderland B, uh, you know, the, the readers, the, 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 the fans of the Borderland Beat, even on the Borderland Beat page, they're very knowledgeable. You know, those are the people that, they're all, you know, they know a lot of information about the uh, cartel. So the Borderland Beat, if you go to the blog, you can find the news. But if you go to the, uh, there's also a forum, and you can see a lot of these guys is like really providing a lot of information, a lot of intel. I mean, uh, I, I, I started doing the, some of these uh, conferences with law enforcement, a lot of federal law enforcement. I mean, um, they, all of them, almost all, every one of them will tell me, hey, I, I read Borderland Beat. I get a lot of our information. From Borderland Beat, uh, when the when the CIA and the API came looking for me, <laughs> that's another story. That's another story. <laughs> they, uh, you know, th th that's another thing they were telling me because I was like, am I, "Am I breaking the law?" You know, and I went, "Oh no, just keep it going." You know, we 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 enjoy reading a lot of this stuff. So, um, so you know, is is provided a very valuable uh, format for it, for information to people specifically people here English speaking people. let's let's touch on that a little bit because uh, that brings up a good point where the federal agencies were uh, were even monitoring your blog because it was you were getting information that uh, even they couldn't get it was too dangerous for them to even send their uh, their agents down there uh, and you were getting direct information from collaborators to your page not, not only the videos but secret documents and and uh, you were posting all that stuff, and of course, uh, the government agencies started yeah. seeing that. So, how are you getting right. this information? We don't even know about this, and yeah. so yeah, it was uh, pretty eye-opening information yeah. that you were getting. Uh, I, there was a guy by the name of Pedro that reached up to me. That was probably around 2011. He reached out to me. Um, actually, I have a Google phone number, so that that I used to talk to people, and uh, and he was uh, he happened to be a um, witness protection in Florida. Uh, a, a person that was a uh, high-ranking member of the naval intelligence, and he had a lot. Most of his information was. Are we talking about Mexican ma naval intelligence? Mex Mexican okay. naval intelligence, and um, he had tons of information related to the cartels. A lot of it was classified, uh, not necessarily uh, national security classified, but confidential, because a lot of, um, you know, they had a lot of inform a lot of detailed information. You know, I was getting pictures, I was getting um, uh, witnesses' statements and and uh, warrant, uh, where they did warrants and all that. And we, we actually started publishing some of that, some of that material. Uh, I have some information, for example, uh, when they were tracking Alaska, he's one of the bosses of the Zetas, they were tracking him in Tamaulipas. They had acquired his uh, phone ID numbers and uh, the feds were in the U.S. were tracking his phone, and somehow he was getting this information because it was going to Mexico. Uh, the U.S. was providing this information to them, and then someone from there was giving that information to Pedro, and I was getting like locations, like he's here now, and they were following him, and for some reason, they were just following him. They weren't uh, arresting him, but, but you know, I had that information, and uh, you know, and, and uh, at one time I thought about publishing it, but I thought to myself, you know, that's something I probably don't want to do. I just don't want to put people, um, you know, in danger over there. Yeah. So I wasn't really sure. I, I actually I got scared too. You know, thinking that's something that I, I don't want to, you know, uh, I want to report, but I don't want to be part of part of it, and things like that. So, um, so, but you know, they found. That's when, around 2012, 2013 is when they found out who I was. Uh, they were able to um, find my identity. I was getting phone calls. Uh, we did a couple of reports on Borderland Beat. They went viral in Mexico. They were all over the place. And then they started, I, was, I started to get calls from uh, media, from t 
Univision, Telemundo, that kind of stuff. And then I thought to myself, uh, you know, it's getting too close for me. You know, because we, I used to get, we used to get threats all the time, but they didn't know who I was. And I'm here in the U.S. I'm a law enforcement officer. I'm armed all the time. You know, so I kind of didn't feel um, at risk as much as the, the people over there. But um, once I knew, you know, like I had, I, I remember getting this message from someone that made a th direct threat over something that we posted. I, I didn't even post it, but I was associated, One of your collaborators I was associated with yeah. Borderland Beat. And he's like, you know, and he started telling me where I live, I had my address, my profession. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I think it's time for, I done my part. I, I, I did this for, you know, for f four or five years and it's time for me to move on. Well, this is a, it's a real threat. I mean, it's not uh, it's not something that we took uh, lightly talking about this stuff. It's obviously there's there's uh, consequences to uh, actions, and, and uh, obviously uh, this is a sensitive topic. Uh, but uh, we think people should know about it. And uh, if if you're following us on on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, or we have all those different. Uh, uh, platforms uh, subscribe to us on Facebook. Uh, subscribe to us on on our YouTube channel. It uh, it helps us get seen by more people. So a shameless plug there. Go ahead and click on uh, the subscribe button uh, through uh, YouTube uh, if you get a chance. And uh, if if you have information that uh, would be vital to uh, get out there to the public, let us know. Uh, send us a send, send us an email. It's a very easy email, uh, borderlandbeat at uh, gmail.com. Send, uh, send an email uh, with your name, uh, some kind of contact, uh, or you can just uh, contact us through the email. We can uh, talk that way back and forth, but we will. Uh, if, uh, if you want to come on the show, uh, we could probably get you on via Skype uh, if you're in a place that uh, isn't uh, easily accessible to us, but uh, we're going to... We're going to have plenty of guests coming on. We had one scheduled for today. Uh, like we said, we were excited about it, but she, uh, uh, at the last minute, changed her mind. Uh, I think she started getting pressure from uh, outside sources or something. But uh, uh, we do have a couple others that uh, that are pending. So we do have some good guests that are coming to come on. So continue to watch and and uh, pay attention to what's going on. But uh, what, what do you think... Uh, What's it going to take to, to, to fix this thing? I mean, everyone's got their opinion about how to fix the problem. Legalize drugs. Uh, you know, what, 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 what is it going to take? Well, it's really complicated. Too complicated. Too complicated. I can tell you, the, um, you know, there's a market for the tr drugs. Um, you know, uh, some of these cartels uh, are making billions of dollars. Um, and, they, they, and, you know, they're very organized. I mean, they're not... Uh, like a gang you know they're like they have a it's almost they have a little government within the government yeah they have accountants they have lawyers they have um you know they buy the, the they they tr corrupt and buy off poli the law enforcement over there in mexico and po politicians judges um you know i don't know if you follow the chapo trial but in my book um you know uh, uh the other thing that i was doing is we would get a lot of legal documents in the court court documents from Mexico uh, I was translating some of those and we would uh, you know some every once in a while we come across someone that was talking about the corruption you know like uh, Beltran Leva organization was corrupting uh, people at, at the highest level including the Sino the Sinaloa cartel and and that went on and there, I mean uh, El Chapo implicated Felipe Calderon the oh. president so um, uh, you know, um, so all the millions of dollars they needed to uh, to invest in their in their trafficking business. Uh, so it's very hard. You know, um, I mean, cartels have been around since uh, you know Colombia with uh, Pablo Escobar. Yeah. Uh, it's been around, and um, you know, it's just a complicated. So many factors involved. You know, um, there's a market. You know, uh, they're able to um, traffic the drugs, sell them, and send the money back. Um, and the money is they, they use it to fund their enterprise, buying weapons so they can so they can uh, fight out, out the other cartels so they don't take over their plaza and on and on. Uh, it's really complicated. I wish I had uh, one answer that I can say if we do this, it would take care of it. 
but there's so many factors it's around. Like, it's like solving world know, peace. You can take on, uh, they've been taking taking on the cartels for years. You know, you can look, I mean, when I, I, I remember growing up and listening, my brother used to play Los, uh, Los Tigres del Norte. You know, it's, it's a, it's a. Tigres, those North. Yeah, the, the Tigers from the North. Oh, there you go. That's and right. those guys, man, and, and, and I fell in love with the music, actually, but it's a, it was all narco corridos. You know, they're talking about trafficking drugs. And, you know, and we're talking about in the 70s. Making heroes out of drug dealers. Yeah, in the 70s and 80s. And, I mean, it's been around. So, um, so I think it's going to still continue, continue to be around. I really don't, I mean, all we can do is just continue to minimize and, and continue to take on the cartels. Uh, one answer I, I don't know. I, I mean, there's a c interconnection, you know. Um, in a way, you know, people were saying, well, we shouldn't give Mexico money. You know, we need to take, we need to take care of our business over here. But, you know, um, sometimes Mexico needs the help, you know, the, the, to take him to take on because, if, you know, it's like uh, when Trump, you know, he had the military, the National Guard, Mexican National Guard, help with the border. You know, and the same with the drugs, you know, uh, they, we need to help them so that they can at least have some control of the cartel so that, you know, uh, so that we're not getting the flow of drugs coming through the border. So let's let's talk about the wall. I mean, obviously, that, that wall thing is in the news all the time. Trump has says uh, President Trump has uh, made that a big part of his campaign, got him elected, I think, uh, in, in, in certain terms but uh, we we took a visit down to the border uh, a couple months back and uh it uh we we got a behind the scenes uh, look at uh the brand new section of wall that was built by the private builder fisher industries on some private land fascinating wall but uh, uh taking a tour of the city from uh, our good friend sean bryan uh, another crazy marine uh he uh he showed us uh some inf in interesting uh uh, stuff going on over there where it's not even the Mexicans that are necessarily coming in anymore. It's it's a lot of the people down uh, way south of Mexico even that, that are starting to come in and, and uh, cause problems. And and, uh, and that's, uh, it, it was interesting with the wall, whereas it doesn't matter how big that wall is or how long it is, people were getting through right there in the city limits from what we saw uh, we took a trip onto the Mexican side, and we saw herds of people going through. We caught it on video. It was it was kind of a funny little thing, but there's there's holes in the fence where people can just run through and walk through. Uh, there's a gap in the train station where trains go through and through the tracks, and people just walk through there because they don't. Sh not like they can shut the gate where the train goes through. It's just just things like that, and that that's just what we can see. I mean, there's there's so many places along the, the uh, right. So, I know. So the, so the wall is it yeah. going to work? Or I mean, what what what's your opinion about yeah, that? Yeah. So we took we took a ride. We, we you know we took a trip to to uh, El Paso and Juarez to look at the wall situation. Uh, what's going on right now? I can tell you, is that there's a big influx of uh, immigrants from Central America. They're they're trying to. Uh, you know, uh, make it across the border, and in 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 what is you know, and, and we even saw a whole bunch of Cubans, you know, and m most of them are basically, uh, you know, they're not your typical Mexicans where they try to sneak in and hide, you know, these these people uh, just want to step foot on U uh, make U.S. soil. It's that easy. It's that easy, and then say you know, um, and and basically uh, they amnesty get amnesty or uh, I saw. Uh, uh, they get processed, you know, so b b so that's what we saw a lot of that. Um, you know, one of the things um, that uh, that happens with what is, in my experience, has been that, you know, um, a lot of these cartels control everything in these uh, border towns. They'll control not not just the drug trafficking, but they also control the uh, human trafficking. You know, uh, the coyotes. You know, many times, you know, they have to get permission or they have to pay part of their, their profits they make uh, in crossing people to the cartels. So, uh, so you know, we saw a couple of the coyotes that were crossing people, and they were looking at us very, very, very strange. Suspicious. Very look. suspicious looking. So uh, that that goes on. And that was important for me, and, and I'm thinking about uh, doing another trip over there. But that's important that we see the other side, because we go there, we, t we look at the U.S. side uh, of the wall, 
and then uh, but then you get a different perspective when you go to the other side you know and the, the thing with trafficking of drugs you know uh, wall is not the 100 percent solution you know I mean um, there's thousands of thousands of vehicles go, come, coming in through the port port of entry and uh, you know how I, I, you know I want to say that poss possibly the, the majority of the drugs are coming in through vehicles vehicles and of course El Chapo Guzman was very famous with his tunnels Tunneling, yeah. right so we'd, he would do tunnels and um, and uh, you know I, I've been uh, I mean in, we make the you know those walls real high but you know the people that really want to get across they get across you know and I mean we've seen I've seen people videos on YouTube where you know people are just climbing those walls you know or getting a ladder or whatever the case might be it's really hard to um, monitor that the, the miles of border that that we have between Mexico and the US it's very costly um, you know so the wall you, you know you build a wall and you leave it like that without monitoring it you know I mean people, they're gonna find a way there's a lot of technology in the, in the wall uh, the, the old section of wall was basically a barbed wire fence that you could just cut through and walk through and whatever but the, the I know the new one there's a lot of media behind it that they're building it with all this uh, anti-tank technology and cameras and motion mm -hmm. sensors and, yeah. and uh, all this crazy technology technology but there's always going to be holes and gaps that people can get in if they want and and uh, it, it, it's a problem uh, or it may not be a problem I, I, I don't know but uh, it's uh, it's something that, uh, that a lot of people are trying to address way above our pay grade and uh, it, it's a battle that uh, isn't going to be one overnight and in one term uh, with one president it's uh, it's going to take the cooperation of a lot of people on exactly. both sides exactly <laughs> and so right. it's uh, it's one of those never-ending problems um, let's, let's kind of talk about some current events uh, we, we got into your background a little bit uh, Comandante Archie where yeah where so you know um, so if anybody ha if anybody is new to the Borderland Beat blog you know uh, if you want to read uh, up-to-date current information on, on, the, on the Mexican cartels that's the to-go place and that the, it's it's uh, www.borderlandbeat.com very simple and, and all the crazy hardcore uh, videos and stories that you want to see are on that web page Un They're just, unfiltered yeah we we can put whatever we want on the website uh, the, the the Facebook page uh, we got to be careful what we post it's good we've been uh, banned and, and <laughs> censored, and, and uh, obviously Facebook's a, f uh, a family channel. YouTube, same thing. But uh, uh, if you want to really read uh, and get in-depth uh, information, there's there's a book that Alex wrote uh, by the same name, Borderland Beat, uh, or go to the website and uh, uh, read the unfiltered version stuff. But uh, right. Uh, so uh, so the first incident we're going to talk about is. Um, that it that happened um, in Quintana Roo, in the up at Cancun area region area. Cancun it, is in the, uh, the the paradise where people used to go on yeah, vacation. All the tourist places. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, um, many times all the cartel activity typically gets focused. Many times, you know, in the past has been especially like that on the border regions. Uh, you know, we start to see some. Uh, also on the Pacific Coast, you know, where, where uh, you know you got, you have places like uh, like uh, Mazatlan that was you know, and um, Acapulco that has become almost a ghost town, you know, because of the violence. But um, anyways, but we every so often we run into things uh, all over all over Mexico, you know, and uh, there was a, a a police inspector that was uh, abducted you know uh in uh, in that area from from the which area the Quintana Roo okay. the, the, that that area that uh, in the where Can you know was tourist area with Cancun um and he was uh abducted by the uh the Jalisco cartel the Jalisco cartel new generation the, the, who are who are really CJNG yeah who really have uh Almost all cartel uh, activity right now is coming from them. They become they, they're very ambitious. They want to take over a lot of the 
um, you know, areas that are cartel related. So he was uh, basically abducted. They did a video that, that they posted on social media and he's holding a rifle and he's talking about that, you know, he feels that he uh, start, that he got orders to target the, the, the Jalisco cartel and uh, making room for other cartel, cartel to move in, kind of trying to give the impression that he's working for another cartel uh, and trying to take the cartel out kind of deal. And then they end up executing them. So, uh, so basically that's what he's talking about. So we'll, we'll kind of show the video uh, of that. So Barry Smith uh, via YouTube is coming in with a question. Would you guys consider uh, Incites information accurate? I don't know who that. What, what's Incites? I mean, are we getting that right, Nick? Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll follow up. yeah, so we don't know who that is. So, so go ahead and, uh, and clarify it a little bit, and, and we'll, we'll see. We'll try to figure out what you're talking about. But uh, so so this uh, commander, the police of the police force, is that? He's a what? police inspector. Okay. For for the state police. In, okay. in in that state, in Quintana Roo, is a state. Uh, was abducted. They made a video, and they, many times they make him talk. And you know, he he kind of says, "Well, you know, I kind of screwed up, and I shouldn't have done that." So he kind of knows. I've never, I've never understood that these these torture videos. They always make them admit to all these crimes, and and uh, yeah. and then and then they kill them anyway. It's not like they're they're gonna. Uh, all right, we're gonna let you go now since you admitted all that. Good luck with life. Uh, uh, the, the, whether you say, whether you admit to all this stuff or not, the, right. the result is always going to be the same. Yeah, and he's he's implicating like the governor, uh, saying that the governor is behind this whole conspiracy or this whole uh, corruption thing, and he's also talking about the uh, the, the secure the, the the state the guy that's in charge of the whole state uh, sec, uh, law enforcement. Uh, so uh, so he you know I'm pretty sure they tell him what to say. And then hoping that you know they'll have a heart. Yeah, you're not, holding out hope. I not guess killing, when you got guns. Not killing them. But you know, sometimes if you don't talk, I mean, they they torture torture you. you. So yeah. you know, but they ended up, uh, of course, decapitating them. And um, and uh, you know, in the, in the video, we'll show the picture at the end of him decapitated, not the actual decapitation. Although we've heard there's a video out there of that. But also, and then and finally they wrap him a, a, in a blanket. We call it an encovijado, uh, and then they they dumped him, um, you know, like in the center of town. We're not going to play that on this show, but uh, if if we do, I mean, there are pictures of the the behead, the, the beheaded body on the steps of the so police I'll, station, I guess. But we're never going to show the video. Uh, are we going to show that? I think we are. Okay. Doesn't doesn't bother me. We can show it. Okay. Well, uh, it, it, but but as far as the 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 actual video of the beheading, we no, don't no, we no. don't have that. We don't have and, it. And and we're not gonna. Uh, I think that's a little too graphic for for this for this channel. But if and when we do get it, right. Like I, like we talked about, it will be on the the uh, website. Uh, uh, so yeah. So borderline beat uh, blog. Uh, one of the things that ha that when I was. Uh, in, you know, when, when I was running or overseeing the, the blog, we used to get a lot of executions. And one of the things that started bothering me was that, you know, I didn't want to give these animals a platform to post all their, their executions. So uh, th we made up a decision back then that, you know, unless the video had some sort of, you know, news worthiness or news, um, a story behind it, we weren't just going to post the executions just for the f sake of posting them, you know, because a lot of people just want to see the gory stuff. Um, but uh, we did, we do, you know, when we run a story, you know, we try to show everything. And the other thing that happens with us was that it was important for us to uh, let the public know ex the extent of the cartels, what they're capable of doing. So that was important for us to do. But, you know, at the same time, you know, we, all, we always want to find a balance so that we're not just showing gory yeah. executions because because the main thing is to educate not necessarily uh, right. uh, scare people or right. or do that so this guy i guess he corrected his uh his post and said the insight intelligence agency uh right. do they yeah they, they they're a private intelligence organization yeah they, they they provide we've used a lot of their information for our our blog 
Okay, so what we're going to do is play, uh, we're going to play the video uh, of, of the, basically the interrogation video of, uh, of uh, Comandante Archie. And uh, we ready to go, we ready to do that, play that, Nick? Yeah, just uh, increase the size on that. Okay. If I can. Uh -huh. All right, hold on. Technical difficulty, sorry guys. <laughs> this is our first uh, podcast. Yeah, we'll figure it so, out. So, so we so yeah, hopefully we can work out the bugs. Work out the bugs. <laughs> yeah, we thought we were cool until it came to it. So there we go. All right, we ready? Pertenezco a la policía estatal, mi grado es inspector. Estamos al mando del comandante Aquiles, del comandante Capella. Tenemos órdenes directas de acabar con el cártel Jalisco Nueva Generación y así mismo limpiar la plaza para que entre el cártel de Lojos. Por órdenes del comandante Aquiles, del comandante Capella y del señor gobernador Carlos Joaquín. Me encuentro aquí por haber detenido a integrantes del cártel Jalisco Nueva Generación. También son colaboradores el comandante Ocampo, subsecretario, el comandante Renan Maestra Sosa, que se encuentra en área jurídica, el comandante Hugo Manzanilla Tilly y Pantrudo. Okay, so what, what's he so, what's so he saying? Still, He's, so I mean, still, first of all, I see him posing with a gun, yeah. which is kind of strange. So it was still going. It actually, there you go. Oh, it's still going. Oh yeah. Okay. So there's. So so basically, what he said was that. Uh, there's the end result. That's that horrible. He, that he got orders from the governor and the secretary of uh, public safety from the state that uh, they take on the the Jalisco cartel. And make room for. Uh, he mentioned the cartel by Los Rojos cartel. It's a cell, cell, uh, breakaway cell from, from different cartels. I'm like, we're not, we, we really don't have a lot of a lot of information on that, on that cartel. And then he talks about um, that they've arrested a, f uh, a few, and we're actually going to show uh, later on uh, some some uh, a, a recent arrest of uh, some of this uh, Jalisco cartel. They're starting to hit him hard, but that's what happens with law, it's, it's, it's a hard life being a law enforcement over there in Mexico. You know, that plata and plomo kind of thing goes on, you know? So you're either part of the cartel collaborating uh, on the payroll or you're the enemy. And that's what happens, you know? So, uh, so me as a law enforcement officer, you know- uh, Yeah, you take I mean, that to heart when you I see- I take that to heart and I, I mean, I see, uh, you know, I, I don't judge, I don't uh, criticize because of, you know, the fact that they're there and I'm over here. And, and it's a very honorable for some of these officers that will do that, will fight the fight knowing the risk, true risks. You know, if that, sh if that shit happened here, it would be all over the fucking news. Yeah. I'm telling you, and I'm, excuse, my, excuse my language, yeah. but I'm telling you, you know, some, sometimes, you know, if, if there's not multiple uh, executions, like f four or five people, sometimes over there it doesn't even make the news. And you will have, like, you know, four or five officers that are ex executed over there. And it's just another day, you know. And um, and it just becomes a way of life for law enforcement over there. It's tough because, I mean, this guy, I mean, as far as we know, he was an honest police officer, started for all the right reasons. Uh, uh, trying to clean up his town, his city, his, his area, which is a touristy area. And he was targeted just because he was the one of the high-ranking uh, officers of that department and, uh, and paid the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah, and if you can imagine the, the message it sends, you know, and that's the reason they do it, the message, the message it sends to uh, other police officers. You know, and um, but yeah. that's, that's why you want to take up that that uh, profession when look what happens to you ultimately. Yeah, and and that's why the only ones that are really doing um, 
and I'm not gonna say they're the only ones, but the ones that the ones that are very effective over there are the federal police because of the fact that they move them around the country, and their identity is concealed because they were, they wear a ski mask. Uh, same with the military, you know. So they try to hide their identity because over there, cartel enforcement is you know risk risky. So, anyways, that's. So that's that's the story of uh, Comandante Archie and uh, rest that, in peace, my brother. That that just that just is pretty. That's pretty brand new recent stuff that that just happened. And, yeah, and uh, it's still going on down there. And, uh, that's that's one battle. So the next one uh, that we're going to talk about is the, the the how do you say it? The Ura Urapan. Uruapan. Turo Uruapan. 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 Uruapan Michoacan. <laughs> That's the the, the bar Tierra Grill. Caliente. That's you know where the Familia Michoacan and the Knight Templar uh, operate. But uh, Jalisco Cartel has been really moving in there very hard. Um, so uh, they're actually uh, been fighting some some of the breakaway from La Familia. We've seen a lot of activity going on, a lot of violence over there in that area, the Michoacan area. There's been a big increase. But anyways. Uh, these these sicarios, uh, hitmen guys, two of them, go into this um, this bar, a restaurant bar, uh, uh, California Grill bar, and they target one guy that is part of um, Los Viagras. Los Viagras are a uh, cell of the Sinaloa cartel, and they target him, and they end up killing uh, him, that individual, along with two others, and unfortunately. Also, uh, the the uh, waiters killed. Uh, so these guys go in there in the middle of the day, you know, with rifles and handguns, and they just open fire. And then before they leave, they, they pull out their handgun and they do, uh, you know, they they shoot the people in the head to make sure they're dead. Basically, uh, so that's that's going to be our next video. Uh, let's uh, play this when we're ready, Nick. So this is the bar. There's no audio on this. Yeah, so you'll see there's one right there starts shooting at them. Oh, yeah, look at and that. And then the, the, the waiter tries to run. He's just shooting with his rifle, and then he pulls out his handgun, and then he goes around and shoots him in the head. Jeez. And there's another guy that comes in. He's shooting them with the head, shooting him with his handgun on the head, and then he'll pull his rifle and, and spray them with gunfire. Middle of the day. People are hiding underneath the table, scared to death. And that was the, the, the there were two of the sicarios from the um, Jalisco cartel. Mm. Horrible. That is the business of the of the cartel sicarios over there, man. Yeah, they're they're ruthless people. You know, they very rare that they, you know, eventually they either get killed or get arrested. Even the big guys, even the the ones that are on the top don't last. Yeah. You know, I think the longest uh, veteran top capo is El Mayo Zambada. Uh, he was equal to the to El Chapo, and he's still around, but very few of them are. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put pull up some uh, some pictures that were kind of the aftermath. Yeah, that's that's. So this 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 was just a bar. They just a random bar they picked because just because I mean it wasn't connected to anything. No, that we know because of. they knew that this gentleman that's uh, part of Los Viagras was there, so he was targeted. Okay. And unfortunately, the waiter ran away, but he kind of ran where they were, ah. and he just happened to be in the line line of sight for the sicarios, and they just shot him shot him up with the rest. So all four were killed. Okay, well, so the arms, uh, let's see, what, what are we going on to, arms in Jalisco? Yeah, so the, the next one, you know, it's just a picture, but the next one is basically uh, the government, especially the federal government, the military police, has, has made the Jalisco cartel their number one target, in, uh, trying to uh, really take him on. And um, so they've been trying to hit him hard because these guys are very... I mean, they do things around the open. They, they'll travel in convoys, heavily armed. They're, they've been making a lot of money. 
and uh, uh, this one is where they actually did a bust of the, some of the sicarios, and they found. So all these two guys uh, pictured here. Oh. Yeah, and, and there should be four of them. Uh, this that's two of them there, and the chicken is you know, all these cartel guys have pretty interesting names. They have all these nicknames, and some of them you know like. Yeah, I don't know about uh, I don't know how chicken. They, I don't know how they come up with them, but some of them are pretty pretty funny. So, so what do we have with some pictures of so a so, lot of drugs? So, yeah, so let's show the, dro the, we the, wep weapons. the weapons, but the reason that's important, and that's what I decided to kind of show this, and I don't know if you can make it bigger. <laughs> that's about as big as it gets. <laughs> but basically, said. you know, um, this is the weapons that these cartels have are, are, you know, it's just a scary thing, you know. So basically what they found was um, 22 assault rifles, six uh, handguns, uh, they found uh, 70 magazines fully loaded with, with uh, rounds. Um, they found uh, two of the um, two of the assault rifles had uh, grenade launchers. They f they had 41 of the grenades. Uh, wow. And then they of course you know found um, cocaine and methamphetamine when they got busted. But uh, but you know they're Cartels don't don't mess around over there. That's why, I mean, uh, you you know every time we go to Juarez, you know we see all these police officers, actually patrolling, walking around, carrying rifles, long rifles, because of the fact that that's who they are dealing with. You know, cartels that are heavily armed, um, with assault rifles, uh, rifles that will penetrate any type of soft mm -hmm. um, body armor. So. Uh, so, so you know they're. I mean, they they invest a lot of money in in fighting and protecting their uh, enterprise. Of course, they they're gonna. And it just seems like the officers even down there are outgunned. Uh, the officers have AR-15s, AK-47s. Uh, oh yeah. But then the uh, the cartel guys have. Uh, 50 cows. Yeah. Oh. And, and, and most of the law enforcement, they carry AR-15s. I mean, they don't, they're not into the AK-47s as much. I mean, I've never seen one. But I, I can tell you that those guys are, have like 50, like 50 millimeter uh, weaponry, like real heavy duty weapons. Um, they all take on the military. I mean, wow. I mean, there's videos um, that you can view on YouTube where they're actually fighting, you know, engaging uh, the Mexican military kind of deal. So. So let's go on to the little Sicario boy. The, this this was a, a kind of a sensitive topic on the YouTube page, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, or, or, or the Facebook page. We initially posted this video on the um, on the on the Borderland Beat uh, Facebook page, um, and we ended up taking it down, and primarily because of the fact that this little boy, eight year old little boy, holding an AK forty seven. Um, before you play it, though, let me just give you a little background because he's kind of, so we can hear him talk. And basically, what uh, what's going on is is uh, you know he's challenging Mencho, the the guy in charge of the um, uh, of the Jalisco, yeah, the Jalisco cartel, and and Mencho is a scary guy, man. He's you know he killed uh, he has killed people. They have spoken bad about him on social media. You know he killed uh, El Pirata de Culiacán, a guy, that, a blogger guy, and, and then and then and one day you know he was drinking and he kind of started talking really bad about Mencho and he got killed the next day so uh, so when you talk about Mencho you know um, that's especially if you live over there you're signing you know, your death warrant that's extremely dangerous over there everybody <laughs> knows that unless you're saying good stuff about yeah, it yeah so he he uh, he's from you know Sinaloa the little boy and uh, he brings up R5 and uh, he R5 uh, is one, he's one of the brothers that started the Gente Nueva, is an armoring a cell of the Sinaloa. And R5 became a hero among the young children. And they have written a lot of narco corridos about wow. that guy. And so he's, so basically what, you can listen to him and, you know, just give you an idea, eight-year-old little boy holding an AR-15, challenging one of the most dangerous cartel bosses of this of the Jalisco cartel and the little boy is telling them listen good Mencho I can kill you fuck 
just so you can see who is the real R5. And then he kind of cracks cocks, cocks, yeah, cocks the, uh, the AK-47. All right, so let's watch this. We ready, Nick? Mira bien, Mencho, la verga. Te vamos a quitar esa popa. Más para que sepas que no es la mera verga del R5. Eh, papi, te puedo matar, güey. Aunque me... Que, que eso, que los que traes tú me pelan la verga. Los del Jalisco a la verga. Saben que nosotros estamos para topar la verga. Estamos para <laughs> Wow. So this, uh, that was actually a pretty well-produced video. They even added music to it. I don't know what the heck they're thinking. But uh, this kid is basically uh, taking on one of the biggest drug dealers around right now. And, and uh, he's, Yeah, he's, he's making threats and challenging them. Um, some, you know, we find a lot of young people getting involved. You know, everybody has dreams. In Mexico, everybody has dreams of having nice cars and money and having the pretty girls. And, uh, you know, the, the narco cartel is real popular, especially in Sinaloa. Sinaloa. And, uh, you know, like me, man, I grew up listening to, like I told you, like the Tigres del Norte, you know. And I, I didn't really think too much about it then. And I, and I still, I, actually, in a way, I still like the music. But, you know, the message is not a real good message. And it's, yeah. it really doesn't lead to any, I mean, you know, eventually you find death, you know, in that kind of life. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's not going to end positively no. for you. So let's uh, let's talk about your book a little bit. So uh, this is the Borderland Beat book that came out in April, and man, I'm. I didn't think it was going to do as well as it's doing. So you kind of you kind of did it as uh, just just to get it out there, get yeah. some information out there. But there turned out to be a lot of interest in it, and it's yeah. been selling pretty pretty rapidly, and it's, it, it's been hard to keep uh, copies of it because. Yeah. A lot of your, a lot of people here in town are, are tracking right, you right. down. And so it's done real well. Uh, you know, there's uh, major distribution, so you can buy it anywhere on Amazon. But it really gives you an idea. It goes into a lot of detail. Everything that, you know, some of the things that I spoke uh, about are in the book. You know, some of the things that, that happen that, um, but it gives a lot of detail. So if you really want to learn a lot of the, how cartels work and what is, you know, from 2008 to 2003, 2013 was the peak of the drug, the cartel war that was going on. You know, it goes into like the Familia Michoacana, the Beltran Labor Brothers, Sinaloa, Los Zetas, the Gulf Cartel. It goes into a lot of detail talking about some of the big capos like, you know, uh, C40, El Chapo, you know, Arturo Beltran, all these guys that, um, that uh, you know, were huge. Uh, symbols of the cartel you know and um, and 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 you know after 2013 some of these a lot of these cartels was, started getting fragmented uh they were getting arrested they were getting deported i mean not deported but they were getting extradited <laughs> um to the u.s so um so you know but then man I, when i was involved th there was so much stuff so much information that i gathered and, and someone had told me you need to get all that information and put it together so people can have access to it. And that's basically what I did. I went back and I started go going through the blog and getting all this information, adding to make it, f to fill the gaps. And I came up with this book and this book has been received very well. So, um, so I'm just grateful that, you know, people can really learn about the cartels. and Fascinating violence. stories. Yeah, so you, so you, you, so everything that that deals with the borderland beat, I mean, that's how uh, mostly what I talk about is in the book, and you can order it, like I said, Amazon, wherever, wherever. Uh, even even uh, most, it's it's right up in the very current current uh, uh, up to where the FBI was stalking your your photo yeah. studio and, and driving by. And right. <laughs> so all that all that is in there, <laughs> and even how it it came to me, you know. Uh, the local uh, connection in Albuquerque, you know, kind of situation. So, and it has a lot of references in the in the end uh, uh, of the of the book. You know, you can read about the cartels and so, you know some of the language. You know, I actually, this book I had to actually do a uh, you know kind of like an introduction to to the book because 
because a lot of the language that uh, that we use in uh, doesn't translate doesn't over. translate well, or just the cartel language is so different. Like plaza, for example, people always say, "Well, isn't plaza like a like a park in the middle of the city or whatever?" You know, <laughs> yeah, but Civic Plaza. Yeah, like Civic Plaza or whatever. So look at those kind of things, and you know, um, so I had to actually uh, kind of fill them in so that when they're reading the book, they kind of know what's going on. So, uh, but. So recently, we also designed a cool uh, challenge coin. If you guys are familiar with what challenge coins are, take it out of the. It's kind of hard to do it justice on on video, but uh, it's it's a three dimensional uh, skull that's uh, on the cover of the book, uh, with some turquoise color, and then the back has a has a cool little. Uh, uh, I guess he's a uh, a drug dealer with his with his pistols. A, sica a sicario. Yeah, there you go. And he's a sicario with a Mexican flag. Wearing his Mexican hat. With hat. A Mexican flag. I can tell you this. So we've been selling these uh, these coins For mostly all. locally here in Albuquerque. So whenever I get someone who looks at the coin, they want they end up buying three or four. Yeah, if only only we're gonna, and the, we're only selling them for like twenty bucks, and then people yeah. like normally sell those things for like fifty bucks. Yeah. So so this thing is very high quality, very well made. It was just basically celebrate the book. It wasn't really meant to make a lot of profit. Our our profit uh, is real minimal. Um, so we're not really making a lot of money. I just wanted to kind of kind of for us to show our appreciation. Yeah and have a, a coin that you can collect. We're probably not gonna order any more. Uh, probably this is the end of it. You know, so we made a very limited run very, and, and we're yeah. running out. So yeah, if you're interested, give us an email, send us an email at the Borderland Beat, or if you know us, uh, the, or through Facebook, or however you're watching this, uh, send us a message, we'll figure out how to get it to you. We tried to sell it on the, on the store, but uh, none of these stores want to sell it because it's uh, it's graphic material, they're afraid of the skull, or I, I don't know. With this topic, we know it's uh, it's tough to, to sell and tough yeah. to get out there, but. Yeah, if you look at the skull, you know, it's like, it's got that uh, Dia de los Muertos kind of culture thing. Drawn but by a drawn by a local artist. By a local artist, uh, Susan Gomez. She's a very talented artist. But then when you look really closely at the skull, you can see like brass knuckles and, and weapons yeah, and bullets of, and pills yeah. and, and barbed wire, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. So the, the detail in it is incredible, guys. I yeah. highly suggest you get, a, get, get purchase a couple of them uh, if you're a collector or get, or get them for a collector. Great, great gifts for, for uh, friends, family, or fans or whatever. But uh, uh, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for taking us through this journey uh we've got plenty of more ideas and guests and shows to come up uh i know some of the people are commenting that it's about time we've done this and yeah we have been talking about doing it for a while and and finally we just uh, had a couple of days off we're, we're so dang busy yes. with uh, other <laughs> video and film projects that uh we just finished the uh, the film festival and if anybody has some ideas i know that the borderline beat uh page there's a lot of uh people that have a, a big knowledge of the cartels so if anybody has some ideas or Please. you want to come on the show or just you know just you can talk, do it you can do it through yeah through, yeah through twitter through uh i mean uh, the, the, what, what do you call the skype right. skype or you want to do it through facebook live yeah. we we can get you on you can wear a wear, wear a mask if you want to uh, we'll, we'll figure out a way to get you on the show uh if you've got something cool to talk about send an voice. email what's that yeah, yeah. Well, we even got voice changing technology. Uh, we can make you sound like that scary guy talking at the beginning of the show. Uh, <laughs> thanks to our producers for for making that happen. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, appreciate it. If uh, if you do have more sh uh, ideas or uh, sh show notes, or you just want to talk to us, book us for uh, seminars, whatever. Uh, give us a call. Send us uh, send us an e email. Thanks, guys. See you next time. <laughs>